Thank you, Tierney, for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the Global Energy Managers Workshop 2023. The first session focused on legislation and policies for electrification. And in this session, we'll be talking about um, electrification execution, end user realities, and lessons learned. We're very fortunate today to have three excellent speakers lined up to discuss their respective experiences on the path to electrification. First up, we'll have uh, Aman Hehar, Associate Director, Energy and Climate Change, Humber College, followed by Bonnie Nixon, who is the Director of ESG and Sustainability at Long Beach Container Terminal. And lastly, we have Andre Nelson, uh, who is an Energy Project Manager at our very own UC Davis campus. So just to quickly go over the logistics for this session, uh, they're pretty much the same as the previous session. We're going to have each speaker present for about 20 minutes. Uh, if we're running out of time, I will um, interrupt you and maybe we'll have to cut you know, the talk a little bit short. Um, at the end of all of the three talks, we will have a final 20 minute session uh, to answer some of the questions. Uh, we will co cover all of these questions at the end. So as you hear from the speakers, please type in your questions into the chat. And I would request that you mention who the question is directed to, just to make it easier for us to navigate. Uh, like the previous session, the chat is enabled. So please feel free to network and communicate. Oh, Maria, I think we would like to introduce her. Her, who is oh. the associate director. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I think you cut out for just a second, but we can hear you, yeah. Okay, so moving on to introduce our first speaker, um, Aman Hehar, who is the Associate Director, Energy and Climate Change for Humber College. Within this role, he is responsible for implementation of the Integrated Energy Master Plan, Humber's ambitious plan to reduce energy consumption, water consumption, and greenhouse gas emissions. Aman is a, pro a professional engineer, certified measurement and verification professional and lead accredited professional, and has 15 years of experience in the energy sector. Over to you, Aman. All right, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just give me a second to pull up my presentation. Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Of course, still Let see. Me stop share, and then you can try that again. Yeah, if you can try sharing again. How's that? Perfect. Yeah, we can see it. Now. All right, yeah, glad to be with everybody today. Um, really interesting discussion. So my presentation today is going to focus on a large uh, heating electrification project we currently have underway at Humber College. The project is called Project Switch, and we're currently uh, about a year into a, the project's three-year construction window. Um, and so, you know, during my presentation, you know, I'll be sharing what we're up to with Project Switch and, and what we've learned uh, so far during our journey. Uh, but first I wanna start with some background. So a little bit about Humber College. Uh, we're located in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We're Canada's largest community college with approximately 35,000 full-time students, uh, about 50 buildings totaling a uh, floor area of 3 million square feet. And that's spread over two main campuses. One interesting thing to take note of is uh, we're very densely occupied. So, you know, especially when we compare ourselves to the Canadian universities, it's not uncommon for a university with a similar student count to have three or four times the square footage we do. Um, and I imagine it's, it's pretty similar in the US as well when you compare the universities to the colleges. Uh, so just make a mental note about that because this occupancy density factor, it becomes important uh, later on when we talk about heat recovery. Uh, since the theme today is electrification, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time up front explaining how Canada's electricity grids are set up. Uh, so each province and territory operates its own electricity grid. And from this heat map showing occupancy, you know, you can see that we like to stick together in Canada. Um, 
75% of Canada's population resides in three provinces, Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. And thankfully for us, these three provinces have some of the cleanest electricity grids in the world. So you can see um, the emissions factors out of the grids for those three provinces in the table uh, in the top right there, and how they compare to, for example, uh, California and the US average. So, so as of today, you know, each of the three most populated provinces operate you know, near zero carbon grids. Um, so generally, the country is in very good shape when it comes to electrification. Uh, and then long-term, uh, the federal government has introduced legislation requiring, requiring all electricity grids to be net zero by 2035. Uh, we still do have some provinces that are still um, operating on coal. Uh, Alberta is the biggest one of those, and you know this legislation would force them to convert their grids to low carbon fairly quickly. Uh, this piece around net zero by 2035 for the electricity grids is, is still pretty contentious politically, I'd say, right now. Um, so we'll see how the future unfolds, but you know that's the vision for the country for now, at least. Um, and then when we look at Ontario's electricity grid, specifically where Humber College is located, uh, Ontario is a little different than the rest of Canada. Um, the rest of Canada, our, our grids are really clean because of the abundance of hydropower. Uh, however, in Ontario, we rely very heavily on nuclear. Um, I know there's some questions around nuclear in the last uh, session. So we can get into that in the Q&A because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on uh, even right now with respect to new nuclear in Ontario. Um, but uh, either way, all that nuclear energy gives us a very low carbon, cheap source of base load and overnight electricity that Project Switch will rely heavily on. Uh, but I'll have more on that a bit later. A uh, couple other interesting things. So our Ontario grid currently peaks in the summer, usually in the early evening around 4 to 7 p.m. And then when we look into the future, uh, we're being told that the peaks are going to shift into the winter um, and overnight. So that's a big change that's coming, and that's expected to happen over the next decade. And that's because of what we're talking about uh, here today, right? It's uh, you know electrification of vehicles and the electrification of heating. A couple other things to point out, um, just to give you an overall sense of where uh, we're, we're landing in terms of costs. Our um, Retail average retail price of electricity in Ontario is about 14 cents a kilowatt hour. And um, we, we also have a carbon tax in the country, which is currently sitting at about $65 per ton, but expected to go up quickly up to $170 per ton by 2030. <clears throat> All right, so with, uh, with some of that background out of the way, I want to focus the rest of the presentation on Project Switch and uh, some of our learnings from that. So at its heart, uh, Switch is a district energy project happening at our North Campus, uh, which is our largest campus. It's approximately 2 million square feet and includes about 30 buildings. Um, as part of the project, we're going to be looking to modernize the heating infrastructure on the campus by eliminating the existing steam network and going to a new hot water distribution system. Uh, we're expecting significant reductions in energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, and our operating costs as well. Project budget is about $30 million, and uh, we just started construction in April and are just wrapping up the first phase as we speak. So before um, I get into the new design, quick overview of the existing central plant systems here. Um, so the existing steam plant dates back to the 1970s. Uh, it serves about 1.3 out of the 2 million square feet on the campus. Uh, the rest of the buildings on the campus have their own local plants. Um, you know, as we all know, steam is really high temperature and very inefficient with all of the distribution losses. Um, We've also got a cooling system on the campus. It's made up of four central fugal chillers with a total capacity of 2,200 tons. Um, cooling system's mostly going to stay intact as part of the project. Uh, scope is essentially to expand the network and uh, get the pipes over to the islanded buildings so that they can all be centralized as well. 
<clears throat> okay, so now getting into the new design. So Switch uh, is going to be demoing all of that existing uh, steam system and network and replace replace it all with a completely new hot water piping system. Uh, with the hot water system, we can operate the network at much lower temperatures. We're going to be down into that 130 to 165 Fahrenheit range. And, uh, you know, with the lower temperatures, we'll have much more flexibility in how we produce that heat, right? Um, and since our grid is so clean in Ontario, focus for us in the project was to electrify the plant heating as much as we possibly could. <clears throat> And so this is an image that just helps visualize what it looks like on a map of the North Campus. Um, the red lines here represent new hot water pipes um, running outside or inside through the buildings. Uh, the dashed lines that you see in the kind of bottom right corner going out to our residences, those are direct buried. And the solid lines are uh, pipes running in tunnels or through buildings. In the top left is building I, which is our central plant. Um, and I should mention that, um, uh, you know, this, this image just shows the main kind of new, um, hot water distribution pipes. We have a lot of, um, kind of existing internal, uh, hot water piping networks that would just stay intact in the individual buildings and we would connect into them and reuse them. So a few key things here. One, um, we're connecting all of the islanded buildings, like I said. Um, so it's most of the buildings on kind of the right side of the campus, the CTI, Guelph Humber, the residences in the bottom right corner. Um, get all of those buildings served out of our central plant, centralize our operations and maintenance, um, and kind of make it easier to, to decarbonize in the future out of one place. Uh, and then if you look in the middle of the campus, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but there's a, there's a loop that the pipes form um, around the LRC building and J back to the central plant. Um, and this was done deliberately. So this ring main is all um, 10 inch pipe size for the full load of the campus for the next 20 to 30 years. Um, so that gives us a lot of flexibility for future growth. We can just uh, tee off of the main and know that we have enough capacity to connect uh, new development on the campus essentially anywhere. Um, and then lastly, this ring main, it gives us some redundancy on the campus as well. If we ever had a leak somewhere on the main, we could just valve off and uh, continue supplying the campus the other way around um, and not impact operations too much. So here we have a floor plan of the existing central plant layouts, kind of a top view. Uh, items in yellow are the existing steam boilers and condensate tanks. Um, all of that will be removed as part of the project. Uh, our chiller plants kind of in the bottom left corner. And like I was saying earlier, that's that will stay as is. Okay, and this is the new layout. So the items in yellow here are all new and would get installed as part of project switch. Uh, we have three types of heat sources now. So we've got our high temperature heat pumps, which are essentially heat recovery chillers, um, recovering heat out of a cooling loop. We've got electric boilers and gas boilers. Um, and the intent is to use the electricity based ones first and as much as possible. Uh, the gas boilers would only get used on the coldest days and they'd be there as a backup uh, if there was a, ever a power outage on the campus. Um, the electric boilers would run off peak. So that's mostly overnight when our electricity rates are low. And then the heat pumps would run whenever we have simultaneous heating and cooling happening. Um, so with this configuration, we're expecting to reduce the on-site um, natural gas use on the campus by 70%, which is quite remarkable. Uh, okay, and this chart just shows visually what I was trying to describe on the last slide. So the x-axis here, I apologize, it's uh, it's in Celsius, but it's showing outside air temperature. Uh, y-axis on the left here is heating demand. And then the y-axis on the right is the uh, number of hours. And then each color here on the bottom is the source of heat. Um, the blue one here, gas rest of campus, this is stuff that isn't connected to our central plant, you know, stuff like you know, rooftop units that are gas fired, domestic hot water tanks. You can essentially ignore this 
this blue one uh, for the purposes of the presentation today. Um, but what, what, you what you can hopefully see here is that um, when we, when the temperatures are mild, kind of when, when we're in the middle of the chart, uh, we can carry most of the heating load on the campus using the uh, heat pumps and the electric boilers, right? You can see there's very little uh, red from the central plant gas boilers. Uh, as you get colder, um, those gas boilers take a much higher proportion of the overall heating load, right? Um, but since most of our um, hours are in the middle range of the chart, uh, we don't need to use much gas uh, most of the time. And that's how we get that 70% drop in overall natural gas use. Uh, so the project also includes a large lithium ion battery storage system with a total capacity of 3.6 megawatt hours. Uh, it'll charge up overnight. We'll discharge it uh, at times when the provincial electricity grid peaks. Um, that doesn't happen a lot. You know, in a typical year, we're expecting about 100 hours of runtime. Um, and this battery system is purely a financial play for us. Um, our utility heavily incentivizes us to lower our demand when the provincial grid is peaking. So, you know, the main job of this battery system is just to lower our electricity rates. And then that makes it much more cost effective uh, for us now that we're trying to, or we are electrifying our heating. <clears throat> okay, and here we have some of the major outcomes from the project. I alluded to some of them. So um, we're going to get the 70% reduction in on-site natural gas use, 40% reduction in emissions on the campus, and 22% uh, reduction in energy use. Um, the project gets us all the way to our interim 2034 goal, which is really nice. And, you know, and sets the stage for our net zero by 2050 goal. Um, you know, to us, the big win is getting the steam out and a hot water system in place that's you know, relatively low temperature because it means we can bring in other heat sources in the future and just connect them to the central plant and go all the way to net zero and fully electric. Um, and then very importantly, this project pays for itself uh, with a 7% IRR, which which is really tough to do when you're replacing major infrastructure like we are in this project. So we're, we're really, really proud of that fact. Um, and then the last three bullets on this slide, I think I've already covered it um, previously, so I won't uh, go over those again. <clears throat> so like I said earlier, the project started construction um, on phase one in April of this year. And we've made really good progress. Uh, the new uh, four gas boilers are installed. You can see a picture of them in the bottom left there. Um, and as of about a week ago, we now have two buildings running on the new hot water network, which is really exciting. Uh, I know two buildings doesn't sound like a lot, but they're two of the biggest buildings on the campus and they represent about 15% of the campus's square footage. Uh, so all in all, we're really happy with where we're at but we also know there's a lot of work ahead of us. So um, phase, phase two um, is currently in design. It's got a much bigger scope and we're hoping to tender that uh, early in the new year and start construction again in the spring. <clears throat> okay, so I wanna finish off with a few uh, of the lessons learned so far. Uh, lesson number one, uh, expect challenges with your electrical utility. Um, we had them uh, and it's been a common theme that I've heard from many other people, uh, not just locally here in Toronto, but across the country. And when I attend conferences, um, you know, I hear it a lot from people in the US as well. So, you know, start having those conversations early with them and, uh, and definitely plan for some extra time getting whatever approvals you need uh, for that electrification. Uh, lesson number two, you have to be creative. So we didn't have many examples of steam to hot water conversion projects that, uh, you know, lowered emissions at this scale and were able to provide a financial return. Um, I think, you know, there's some out there, but they're limited, those examples. And I think that's probably the case generally for electrification projects right now. There aren't a ton of examples out there. So we all have to be creative, right? Um, so some examples for us, uh, were, you know, the inclusion of the battery system in the project, for example. 
Uh, it didn't have to be part of the project, but by combining it, uh, we were able to improve the economics of the whole project and that helped get the project approved. So um, that was kind of one way we had to think, think outside the box. And then um, heat recovery. I just want to mention that, uh, you know, we have those heat recovery chillers. A lot of that heat we're getting is by turning off the airside free cooling economizers and, and maxing out our, our heat recovery wheels uh, to over, overheat our supply air. You know, some of those things have been done before, but we, you know, we had the added challenge in our climate to figure out how to do that and have those chilled water coils running in the winter and not freezing. Um, you know, so all of these challenges we had to overcome to make the heat recovery chiller work as part of the project. But once we got the heat recovery chiller in, uh, it, it improved the economics of the whole thing and kind of made the whole thing work. So yeah, definitely um, you have to be creative. And then uh, lesson number three, don't be afraid to challenge the experts. I have in quotations here. So like I was saying before, there isn't a ton of experience with this stuff, at least not here in Toronto. So we're all kind of learning together, uh, including the design and construction community. So for, for Switch specifically, uh, back in 2016, when we first envisioned the project, you know, we were looking for a cost-effective way to get rid of that steam system, right? And get that new hot water piping network in. So our solution at the time was a combined heat and power plant. That solution made sense in 2016, but a few, few years later, post Paris Climate Accord, it just didn't make sense to us to be installing something that was going to be increasing our emissions, even though, if it, even though it was gonna be temporary. So in uh, 2019, we hired a consultant to do a detailed feasibility study. They were a European consultant with a lot of district energy experience, and they told us it wasn't possible to electrify and have a payback. Uh, and after a lot of pushback, they did eventually find a solution using an air source heat pump and a chilled water storage tank. Um, and the, the problem there was that, you know, the international consultant didn't quite understand the local market and, and how our electricity rate structures worked in Ontario. Um, but had we listened to them, we would have been stuck, right? So, um, um, you know, that's, that, was, that was an important learning. And then if you look at our, our current solution, it's completely different than even the feasibility uh, study, right? It's relying on heat recovery chillers and electric boilers as the backbone. Uh, and even with that, you know, we've had other consultants tell us that we don't have enough simultaneous heating and cooling load for the heat recovery chillers to work. So, um, you know, I think with all of that said, just be very careful when you're getting advice. Uh, don't be afraid to get a second opinion and, and definitely ask hard questions and don't accept the answers until they make sense to you. Thank you so much, Aman, for your talk. Um, it's definitely fascinating to see a similar project when we have our own big shift going on and definitely there's a huge difference in the climate. So it's interesting to see the difference in the decisions that have been made. Um, I've got some questions lined up for you, but I'll move on to the next speaker, um, who is Bonnie Nixon. Um, Bonnie Nixon has held many high profile positions at the global forefront of a low carbon, resource protected and just economy. Her career trajectory included a position as Director of Global Sustainability at Hewlett Packard, Walmart, Mattel, ERM, as well as two dec decades on environmental infrastructure with the regional, state, and federal government. Today, as Director of Sustainability at Long Beach Container Terminal, she is responsible for leading the Net Zero 2030 strategy, grants management, ESG reporting, stakeholder and community outreach, and LBCT's day-to-day -day environmental operations. At night, Bonnie is a professor of sustainable supply chains at Harvard and UCLA. Ms. Nixon obtained a bachelor's from Penn State, a master's degree in learning technologies, and is currently completing a PhD in global leadership and change in complex supply chains at Pepperdine University. Over to you, Bonnie. Hi, Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to start with the video. So let me put it on full screen and start with that. Okay. Hopefully you'll hear. It was a bold idea, first conceptualized in 2001, to create one of the largest and greenest terminals in the world by combining two aging terminals into one. Construction started in 2011. Today, it is a reality. 
Long Beach Container Terminal at the Port of Long Beach is one of the world's most advanced shipping terminals with its zero emission operation and state-of-the-art technology. Capable of handling 3.3 million TEUs annually, more than double the capacity of the two aging terminals it replaced, LBCT is one of the busiest container terminals in the United States. Using clean electricity to power its entire operation, today, the 4,200-foot-long wharf can welcome the largest container ships in the world. To cut emissions, all the ships plug into shore power electricity while at first. Then, using the only ship-to-shore cranes in the Americas capable of lifting two containers at the same time, the terminal can service three of the largest ships in the world at once. To quickly move the containers to the storage area, 102 Automated Guided Transport Vehicles, or AGVs, deliver them to the fully automatic stacks, where the all-electric, fully automated stacking cranes load the containers onto trucks. This highly orchestrated zero emission operation is not only green, but also highly efficient, offloading and loading ships in less time than any other terminals on the West Coast, with trucks moving in and out of the terminal with record speed. For cargo that will be delivered by a train, the Intermodal Rail Facility has six semi-automated rail cranes to load and unload trains onto the largest on-dock rail facility in North America. All this using clean electricity to power these giant machines, making LDCT one of the most sustainable terminals in the world. The vision was clear from the start. Design and build a terminal like no other, a green terminal where the economy and environment thrive together, where green means productivity, jobs for our workforce, prosperity for the region, and protection of our air, water, and natural resources. The future is now at LBCT. Awesome. I have to make sure I close that up because that's that. All right. And then I share um, my PowerPoint. Here we go. Just on my big screen. All right, this is not um, getting big enough. I'm just trying to switch over to, there we go. Okay, is that good? Can everybody see the um, slides now? Oh, yes, we can see them, but you're not in presenter mode. Oh, okay. How do I change to that? If you go to the top of the screen where it says display settings, yeah. out right where you were just were, and then click swap view. Well, swap. Mm -hmm. Okay, how's that? Perfect, thank there you. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, let me um, jump right in. So um, why the need for this change um, is our, our first um, conversation where we're, we, you know, we really noticed that um, the, we, we needed to transfer some of our truck traffic to rail. We needed to alleviate the congestion that we see in the San Pedro port complex. You know, it was a, a goal also the trucks today can spend as much as two, three, four hours or more um, at other terminals where they have to stop and go to multiple places. But larger ships also needed um, a way to better manage their peaks, which we all saw during the pandemic. <clears throat> that there is a very strong mandate in the San Pedro Port Complex in the state of California to to design a terminal that's net zero. And we have done that design in the entire port operations and we're aligned with what's called the Clean Air Action Plan for the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And finally, to ensure shovel readiness so that we could take advantage of some of the federal and state funding that's out there for us, which as you'll see in a moment, we have successfully done. And why is this not? Letting me forward now. There we go. So who we are, we're a, um, a container terminal that outperforms all of the other vessel, rail, and truck um, productivity metrics in the U.S. We're technologically advanced, and you'll see more about that. And today, we have less greenhouse gas emissions and what is called criteria pollutants. So greenhouse gas is that carbon and that methane the gases 
The criteria of pollutants are NOx, nitrous oxide, sulfur oxide, and particulate matter, specifically 2.5 and 10, which is that soot that you often see as a result of diesel combustion. How we got here, we started back in, it actually was 2006. In 2009, the EIR was certified. Um, it took quite a bit of time to, um, to do that. It was about a 10 year effort before we began construction. Uh, phase one, the first birth opened in 2016, the second birth in 2018, and at the end of 2021, we opened the third birth. And we're completing a few of the things which I'll mention in just a moment. What's on the um, what's on the terminal right now? You see those large ship to shore cranes. We have 18 of those. We have nine. We have 69 stacking cranes. We have six intermodal cranes, which is for the rail. We have 102 of the ADVs you saw in the video that drive themselves, and we have very advanced um, operating software and communications and wiring throughout the entire terminal. So by the numbers, you know, we are a um, 304 acre site. You can see a picture of it there on the right. Um, our current throughput is capable of 3.3. It was actually designed even for 3.5. We got up to that 3.3 number during the pandemic. Um, we went, we were up from 700,000 TEU. So as you can see, we've five times the size of ourselves. Um, we have the deepest water draft. We can, um, store 73,000 containers. We have um, in lanes and out lanes on both sides of the terminals for the trucks to enter and exit. Um, and we have uh, the largest on-dock rail facility on our wharf. Why now? Climate change is here now. Um, the movement of goods represents 20% of all GHG if you look at all goods movement. Um, the ports are located in the the top severe non-attainment zone is in Bakersfield in the Imperial Central Valley. The second severe air quality zone in the country is the San Pedro Port Complex. And we all know why that is. Largely the, the biggest polluter is the ships, comes next is the trucks, then comes the cargo handling equipment at all the terminals. Fourth is the train locomotives and fifth is the tugs. These are all diesel, typically diesel equipment. And it is why we have the air quality that we have here. And so it absolutely does affect several communities nearby, as well as up the 710 corridor, communities like West Long Beach, Carson, San Pedro, Wilmington, Gardena, Carson, um, Compton, Watts, um, South Central LA. These are the communities that also are in a disadvantaged zone. So we, our goal is really to improve the overall quality of the, of the air and the local communities. Our investment today, so that, thus far we've spent two and a half billion dollars to get where we are today. Um, interestingly enough, as a, as a derivative of that, we need about 250 million to get to this net zero. Um, it breaks down by about 75 being spent on actual equipment, which it's important and noteworthy, noteworthy to say that when you add the infrastructure, that is five, six, seven times the cost of a conventional diesel or propane or gasoline vehicle. So it's a huge investment and it's tough in a business environment to prove that ROI out. Um, except for the fact that, you know, there it's increasingly being regulated and we know it's the better thing to do. So we set out to prepare our net zero plan and that is on our website if you'd like to see it. And, um, and it took a solid year to pull all the greenhouse gas numbers together and do all the calculations. And we also determined that we would need about 25 million more of renewables on site, largely solar and distributed gen, and that we would be spending close to 20 million in workforce training, community outreach, um, racial equity programs. We have three pathways to net zero. The first is readiness, the second is resilience, and the third is regeneration. And they align with what we call scope one, scope two, and scope three. And for those of you who don't recognize that taxonomy, um, scope one is that which we directly control, this terminal. Scope two is the purchase from our utility provider, 
just like our last um, speaker said, that that has inherent challenges in it. SCE today is 43% clean and is saying that they'll be 85% clean by 2030. So that means we know for a fact that we have to make up for that 15% if we are going to be net zero scope one and scope two. Today, we're already carbon neutral for all three scopes, and I'll talk about how we got there. Scope three is our supply chain. That's our partners, that's the ships, trucks, trains, tugs at the largest numbers, and then it's our smaller vendors on the smallest, including like employee commuting and stuff. Readiness, all today, all 93 cranes are electrified. Um, we have um, the AGVs that are electrified and these trans the transitions for the additional 270 vehicles is underway. The yard tractors, which I'll, um, there'll be a picture here somewhere, is kind of the workhorse on the terminal. And the yard tractors today represent 93% of our remaining diesel emissions. And we have about 60, 64 of them today. So um, that is unlike other conventional terminals that are still all diesel. They may have over 200 to 250 yard tractors, which are the most highly emitting. Um, the readiness in terms of the ocean, we are the highest birth productivity. And for a couple of reasons, we have dual, our um, dual hoist crane. So the cranes pick up two boxes at once. In addition, and we can load and offload, and we take the largest ships, our ship to shore cranes are the largest as well. So with that, with that happening, we can get ships out of here in three to four days or so, whereas at other terminals that will take seven, eight, nine days. And um, and we today we did not have one vessel out at anchor during the pandemic. When you saw the 106 vessels out there, none of them were ours because we were moving continuously in the fashion that we move with the, all of the electrified and automated stacks and um, cranes. We also took in additional 37 ships. And it's important to note that CARB, the California Air Resources Board, has already regulated the shore power, which means that when the ships arrive, they must turn off their engines and plug into our electric. And right now that has to be done within two hours. And when they leave, they have to leave within one hour of unplugging. If they don't do that, it costs us collectively $1,900 an hour. So we are highly motivated for that to occur. On the rail, we're the largest on-dock rail. Our average dwell time is also faster than our competition because of those cranes. 30% um, today of our throughput goes to rail with 40% goals in the future. We'd love that to be 50, 60, 70%, but the bottlenecks exist well um, on the rail lines and in places like the Alameda corridor. Obviously with more ra rail freight, less trucks on the road, it's better not just for the air quality and, and diesel combustion that they produce, but also the um, congestion on the highways and the safety issues. For the readiness, we also have, um, these, are, these are numbers from 22, we'll get 23 at the end of this year, but you can see how we've performed in comparison to all of the other terminals. The trucks like it here because they come in and out in less than here, you can see 33 minutes. And um, so they, they, they just pull their truck in that stack on there on the left. The the, the uh, crane picks up the, the chat, the container, and then brings them their next one and they drive out. Whereas again, in another terminal, they may have to go three or four different locations to pick up empty chassis and containers. Um, we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by more than 80%. Um, and we've, as you've seen, grown our productivity. We're averaging about 2.5 million, um, not just in 21, but also in 22, and thus far even in 23. So um, the news is that while we um, are decreasing our emissions immensely, you can see down the bottom, we're increasing our electricity usage. So um, our throughput was increased by 244%. You can see our NOx and SOx reductions. We know that we have about 270 vehicles still left on the terminal. 160 of those are just gasoline powered Ford 
150, 250, and 350 maintenance trucks for our longshore workers and um, to conduct maintenance around the around the terminal and what it's going to take to make that final change. Um, we have gone after federal fund and state funding. We were pleased to, um, and that's the yard tractor there on the left, we're pleased to announce that we did get, um, it was a $37.5 um, million grant from the um, Biden infrastructure bill, and we got $30.1 million of that, and we'll cost share the remainder of that. And um, we plan to tr begin that transition in 2024 and, tw right, and finish it in 2026. And um, we are looking at innovative charging options as well. Uh, we also have gone after the state um, money, the CalSTA, and we were uh, awarded $36 million. Um, it was actually a $45 million grant, again, with us spending $9 million for additional cargo handling equipment. That's CHE is cargo handling. So those are forklifts and rail moving carts and what things that we call reach stackers and top handlers. Um, we have submitted another 68 million, actually it's 85 million with our cost share for, in, for replacing just infrastructure. Um, that's what needs to be done. It's not really replacing, it's, it's opening up the ground and adding, adding the conduit. Fortunately, we have a dedicated substation, a 66 kV line. So we don't need to bring in more um, energy from South, Southern California Edison. We just need to put the switch box um, the, the switch gear boxes and um, the conduit in and then the chargers and bring the equipment in. We submitted another 36 to FHWA and we're looking at the um, IRA clean ports funding as well, um, depending on what we're awarded and the other two above. So we are um, aggressively pursuing funds. We do have the largest battery exchange buildings in the world. We're looking at how we can change some of the chemistry on that and put energy storage in those battery exchange buildings. We're maximizing our low carbon fuel standard credits, which um, because of our reduced emissions, and then we turn around and sell those. I'll mention that in a moment. We have um, large solar arrays and five lead gold buildings. We are committed to continuously investigating the use, the, the additional use of solar and hydrogen and biogas and ammonia. And, and of course, with everything, we engage and train our, and empower our workforce and work closely with our surrounding communities. Um, we have today eliminated those, the large, largest percentage of our scope one emissions. We currently have about 4,000 metric tons and we have, gone after offsets that are very material to us in the steel waste recovery space because we have so much steel. We've um, committed to a true net zero before 2030. We're addressing our scope two um, by that low carbon fuel standard credits that we then turn around and reinvest in renewable energy credits or RECs with biogas projects in the Central Valley those are dairy management projects. And then finally, we have calculated our scope three emissions um, from the ships, trucks, trains, and tugs. Um, we're still working on some of the smaller areas and we have purchased enough offsets to get those to carbon neutral as well, which is, as you know, unusual. Most entities are not doing that. And even in our scope two, we are negative 46,000 metric tons because of those um, wrecks that we purchase. Our final area is the whole space of regeneration where we hope to continue to partner. The Port of Long Beach is committed to a large wind project. We'll look at how we can participate in that. We're looking at hydrogen, we're looking at ammonia, we're looking at a lot of other things. Many of our, our beneficial cargo owners, the companies like Ikea or Amazon or Target or Walmart or Wayfair, though, those companies are now asking what we're doing for our scope three, and this is probably a much bigger incentive and motivator than even the regulatory requirements. We plan to become an active um, advocate for stimulating all kinds of system-wide change. Some of our challenges are, you know, the infrastructure is expensive and it doesn't give us the um, emissions reduction. So we have to work 
um, aggressively to help all of our partners and the utilities and, and the funders know that um, that has to be a first part is getting those kind that switch gear boxes and those conduits in. The technology readiness, some of the equipment that we're going after is still in demonstration phase. And we're, you know, often the first gen experimenters. And sometimes that's good news and sometimes it's bad because we're, you know, the way the ones getting the bugs out of it. Um, the return on investment, you know, is a challenge, again, for the reasons that I've just said that they don't they don't produce emissions reduction. So um, it's and they're very, very expensive, these um, zero emissions vehicles. And then consistently and, and continuously engaging, exciting and empowering and training our workforce, as you all know. The ports have um, the ILWU, unionized workforce, and it's just really critical that we work closely with them to make sure that our remaining equipment stays human operated and that we involve them in every step of the way. And that's really it. So um, you've got my name and, um, and email and phone number, and you're welcome to reach out if you've got more questions. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for sharing your contact details. Uh, we'll jump right into the next talk um, that is going to be presented by Andre Nelson. Andre is a UC Davis mechanical engineering graduate from 2017 who spent two years in the HVAC industry designing heat transfer coils before returning to UC Davis to work as a facilities engineer. As the most recent addition to UC Davis's energy engineering team, his focus is identifying and securing HVAC and other energy savings in the student housing, dining, and recreational buildings while supporting related departments in the energy-related projects. Over to you, Andre. All right, thank you. So let's share this. All right, can you all see that? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm Andre. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the insights that we have from uh, electrification efforts here at UC Davis. Um, so to give you some background, um, the UC Carbon Net, sorry, the UC Carbon Neutrality Initiative was a uh, 2013 commitment to become carbon neutral by 2025. We have been diligently working towards this goal uh, with some hiccups along the way. Um, just some facts that are relevant to my presentation about our campus. We have a campus-wide centralized steam loop um, that's aging, uh, a chilled water loop, and then we're in the progress of installing a heating hot water loop. Um, so um, I have a few examples of our work uh, towards reducing carbon emissions and natural gas use on campus to share with you today. Uh, one major project is called The Big Shift, which I will review uh, on the next slide. We're also working towards electrifying our campus kitchens and dining halls, um, which are buildings that provide plenty of, of opportunities alongside some pretty difficult challenges. Um, if I have enough time at the end, uh, I'll touch on our, one of our residence halls and how we approach those types of buildings. Um, but if I don't get to that, it's, it's not the end of the world. So the big shift is a piecewise replacement of the aging central steam system um, with a centralized heating hot water system, much like part of uh, Amon's project switch is about from earlier this session. Um, the project will allow us to eliminate the majority of campus CO2 emissions once completed. So far we've completed phase one, which converted a large portion of our central campus with plenty of lessons learned for phase two, um, which is scheduled to start constructions of uh, construction next year. Big Shift has also driven a lot of additional electrification on campus um, as we have to keep finding solutions to um, keep agricultural, lab, educational, and culinary processes going. Um, there are trade-offs between steam and heating hot water. Um, as Amon mentioned earlier, uh, steam has greater energy losses in the lines. It's harder to meter. Um, but on the flip side, heating hot water is colder. Our system produces a maximum heating hot water temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And this can bring some challenges um, as most of our existing heat exchange coils on campus were originally designed for 180 degree hot water flow. So given this temperature trade-off, we need to prepare for the shift. Um, from trial and error, we've learned that a year or two before the shift, it's really important to change our operating temperatures of existing hot water systems in buildings to ensure that they remain operable at the lower heating hot water temperature when we eventually switch over. 
Um, in some cases, we found that booster heaters or new redesigned coils were necessary to keep certain systems happy. Um, another big challenge for us is that UC Davis is a research and ag university. So some of our lab and industrial processes here use steam and cannot cease. Um, so we still have some localized need for steam for these processes. Um, we found that it's best to approach these on a case by case basis. So I want to talk a little bit about autoclaves. Um, UC Davis, uh, we generate a lot of research material that needs to be sterilized. This is primarily done with steam, typically in an autoclave. Um, in big shift phase one, our general approach to autoclaves was to install a localized electric steam boiler at the building level to serve the building's steam needs. We definitely learned some lessons here. Um, and the first being that for us, this approach was not the best solution. Um, we ran into a lot of water quality issues, which led to failing boilers. Um, we also underestimated the maintenance load that this, these extra boilers would put on, on our steam shop staff um, because they actually have to go out on site every single day to blow these, these boilers down and to maintain them. Um, and finally, we had some end users who were a little unhappy. Um, some of them felt that the reality of the situation hadn't been fully communicated clearly to them prior to the big shift phase one. Um, and they perhaps had bought some equipment that ended up not working uh, with the localized steam system. And they would have rather had spent some extra money to get equipment that would have fared better under the circumstances. I know that in one situation, we actually had research um, briefly halted which is not an ideal situation for a, a research institution. With all that in mind, um, our current approach for phase two is that the steam shop supervisor approaches departments in affected buildings individually, and he explains the long-term difficulties of trying to, to keep equipment on, on a centralized or a building steam system. Um, he, we recommend that they purchase um, self-contained steam generation systems so like autoclaves that can basically generate their own steam. Um, and even though this is an additional cost on the front end, um, we find that it is, it is absolutely worth it to, to keep providing um, these operations. Um, added maintenance costs from a self-contained unit have been found to be negligible. Um, UC Davis actually doesn't maintain their own autoclaves, it's contracted out. Um, but like I said, these units just do so much better and, and um, they serve such an important purpose on campus. More steam ster sterilization. Um, we have greenhouses on campus. Um, they use a ton of soil, actually a lot more than a literal ton, but I digress. Um, they have two autoclaves out there um, and as well as two non-standard methods for sterilization. <clears throat> Excuse me. The initial big shift solution proposed by the contractor was a local one megawatt electric boiler that would provide enough steam to all four pieces of equipment. Um, my team's response uh, was, we thought this was a little bit much. Um, so we went and talked to the greenhouse staff and we asked them two very, very basic questions. The first question was, why? Um, why do you need so much steam? So they provided us with their current procedures and their standardized soil sanitation requirements um, to study. The second question we asked was, when? Um, is the equipment generally actually all on at the same time? Because the boiler was sized as such. The answer was no. Typically only one or two of these pieces of equipment would ever be run at the same time year round due to safety and staff limitations. So what did we do? We looked at their processes and their sanitary requirements. We did some basic math um, and we found that the old manifold they were using to shoot steam into a large box of soil was sized inefficiently. Um, we designed and fabricated a new one. We met soil sanitation requirements using about half the amount of steam as before. So what's really cool about this is that by asking two simple questions and doing one simple test, we were actually able to lower their localized steam system size by over half. Um, that's pretty cool in my opinion. So before um, I move on to talking about kitchens, which is gonna be a big bulk of this presentation, um, I wanna make a quick stop at the Gorman Museum which is a contemporary Native, Native American art museum that actually opened earlier this fall. Um, <clears throat> the air handler and the terminal equipment in these buildings were, um, was updated a few years ago. At the time, we really did want to electrify the entire building, um, but it wasn't feasible for budgetary reasons. 
At that time, though, knowing that we did want to electrify it, we opted to replace the equipment's coils um, that were designed for 180 degree Fahrenheit flow to uh, with coils designed for 120 degree flow. And so currently we are installing a new electrified hot water system out there using an air sourced heat pump, which is pictured. Um, and that'll be completing the electrification of this building. Installing those coils back then actually eliminated the need for us to add resistive electric, electric booster heaters um, on the back end. So things ended up being a lot more efficient. So the lesson learned here is that we had an opportunity to get it right by electrifying Gorman, but we couldn't quite get it all in one project. Um, sizing those coils, though, uh, really set us up for success down the line at the next project juncture. So now let's talk about some kitchens. Um, campus kitchens, uh, we have three different types or three main types, I guess. Um, they use um, typical commercial industrial culinary equipment like steam jacketed kettles, steam tilt skillets, cook chill tanks, griddles, that kind of stuff. Um, our main kitchens on campus are the coffee house or coho, uh, which is a centralized food stop on campus that's completely student run. And that was a part of big shift phase one. We also have four dining commons on campus that serve food primarily primarily to students. Um, and they are operated primarily by full-time staff members. Um, we have other food service on campus, some fast food locations, some third-party food trucks, but they're not really a part of our um, current electrification efforts. So the Coho <clears throat> was our first kitchen that was taken off of steam. It was a part of Big Shift Phase 1, um, and we eliminated centralized steam to building entirely. Um, kitchens posed a very unique challenge to the Big Shift, since there was no more steam for the existing steam-jacketed kettles. We replaced um, three 40-gallon kettles with self-contained kettles that have their own steam generation units, as well as a new dishwasher. Um, our heating hot water system didn't get hot enough for sterilization purposes, so we had to add a 45 kilowatt booster heater to the washer system. Um, at the time of phase one, uh, we didn't have the electrical infrastructure available in the building to install fully electrified versions of this, these, this equipment, so they all do actually use natural gas to boil the steam just locally at the unit. This is obviously not perfect in terms of electrification, but it, it allowed us to kind of test the waters before we started retrofitting our biggest kitchens on campus. Um, the new kettles brought some challenges to kitchen staff and as well as like the timing of cooking meals. Self-contained systems don't have steam immediately available and so they take noticeably longer to heat up. However, the student workers at Coho were able to adjust quickly to the new equipment. So <clears throat> Segundo Dining Commons is our, our largest kitchen on campus. It's our centralized industrial kitchen, which preps food in bulk for um, all four dining commons on campus. Um, it's actually scheduled to be a part of phase two starting next summer. Um, at Segundo, they cook 33,000 meals per day, which is insane to me. Um, pictured here is executive chef Robert Walden, who lovingly on campus is known as Chef Bob. Um, he runs a very tight ship with many of his employees having been there for decades, himself included. And actually, Chef Bob was the guy who kept me fed when I was an undergrad. So it's been very cool to have the opportunity to help him electrify his kitchen. One thing about his staff, they clean and maintain all of their own equipment down to the nuts and bolts every single day. The staff take really great personal pride in the equipment that they operate. And as a result, this is one of the best maintained commercial kitchens that I've ever seen. So one of the challenges that we very rapidly picked up on was the resistance to change from the end users, in this case, the staff. Um, given how personal the equipment is to the staff member who operates it, we realized that we really needed to get their buy-in on the new equipment and involve them throughout the entire electrification process. With an equipment change, the staff expected most of their workflow to remain the same. When they were told that some processes might need to be slightly altered or might take longer, they were hesitant, um, but eventually they did concede that some changes would be necessary. <clears throat> so one thing that we did was we reached out to Frontier Energy, who runs uh, a facility called the Food Service Technology Center in San Ramon, California. 
They have an entire open kitchen there showcasing only electrified cooking technologies, and they allow end users to get hands-on experience with how the equipment works and feels. So in this picture, you can see Chef Bob on the left. He's talking to the um, chef at FSTC. And some things that impressed Chef Bob were the industrial induction stovetops and woks, as well as the electrified combi ovens. The staff were impressed with a lot of the equipment that they were shown, and they definitely seem to be more at ease having been included and listened to as we decide decide upon the, the excuse me as we decided upon the upcoming changes at their facilities. A second problem um, is that uh, at Segundo is volume and time. Um, so in commercial bulk cooking, equipment heat up and cool down time actually really does matter. Um, pictured on the left of the slide is a circular graph of time of day versus operating temperature of um, some culinary equipment. This is how they keep a log of the temperatures that the food was exposed to for um, food safety regulations. It's a little difficult to see, but the log shows that um, the equipment is switched on at 5 a.m. By 6.15 a.m., the system is warmed up to 207 Fahrenheit and it's, and it's ready to cook. So at Coho, which is a small kitchen, the workers are all students who work flexible hours and are trained on numerous equipments. And as a result, it was easy for them to adjust to the additional cooking time in their steam jacketed kettles. At Segundo, however, additional warm up and cool down times from new equipment might mean that fewer batches of food can be prepared each day. Um, Although right now these details remain pretty unclear, it does kind of indicate that electrifying certain equipment, especially in large kitchens, it could potentially lead to some sort of labor issues. Um, you might ask why, why don't we just oversize the equipment, thermally speaking, or add extra equipment to account for, for the change in volume? The answer is that we would if we could, and we will if we can. But this approach creates kind of an electrical infrastructure issue at the building level, and we can only reasonably upsize things so much due to physical and budgetary limitations. So um, <clears throat> let's move on to residence halls. Um, are we okay on time? Uh, you can take two more minutes. Two more minutes? Yeah. Um, I will choose to skip residence halls then. Um, okay. If you guys want to hear more about this, um, feel free to reach out personally. My slides will also be available after the fact. Um, so let's skip through here real quick. Oops. Um, I just wanna finish off with kind of rounding it all off. What did we learn? Um, so number one, local steam needs really need to be carefully considered. Um, we urge others to consider units with self-contained steam generation on board due to the problems that we encountered in Big Shift Phase 1. Um, number two, doing some cursory investigative work can result in massive energy savings, as well as a lower upfront cost on electrified equipment. So ask questions. Um, in the vein of asking questions, involve the end user in the process. This was huge for us to move forward with Big Shift Phase 2 at Segundo DC allowing the kitchen staff to come and try the, the equipment in a hands-on fashion really bought us a lot of rapport. Electrification, uh, number four, electrification could lead to staffing and operational changes. Um, some commercial equipment, especially for kitchens, has physical limitations that will change these procedures. Um, and to reiterate at this, this point outside of kitchens, we also saw this happen to our steam shop with the sheer magnitude of local electrified steam boilers that they have to maintain. And finally, number five, change is hard. When things are running smoothly in a building, people who are in that groove are not always easy to work with when someone approaches them and wants to electrify that building. Um, this is especially true um, when you're doing something new with new technology that may not pan out as well as you'd hoped. Um, so feathers can get ruffled, people can get upset, projects can get expensive, but it's super important to remain diligent through the whole process to iron out any issues until a new balance is found. So don't give up. And uh, thank you for listening. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about what ECO does, you can check out these websites or feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you so much, Andre, for sharing the information and a wonderful talk. Um, I'll move on to the questions from our audience. And I think we, the first question we'll take is from Ryan Hammond, addressed to Aman. Um, he has a three-part question. I'll just ask the first two. Uh, the first question is, how did you test your buildings 
that they can allow for the lowering, uh, for lower heating supply temperatures. And I'll ask you the second part once you uh, address this. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we we tried it out. Um, we we lowered the supply temperatures out of the central plant um, around the campus. We set up. We we, we pre-planned a test um, and what um, what data we needed to set up to analyze the results afterwards. Did the test, kind of slowly lowered it down, um, and then had a look at the results. The testing was done over some of the Kind of coldest weeks of the winter, um, so we're pretty confident that we can we can operate at uh, temperatures that are a little lower than what we had previously. Um, but uh, the way the system's designed, we can um, if we do have issues in operation once once the the new system's in place, uh, we can increase our supply temperature of the plant on the really cold days, and then. Um, and then we could work to replace uh, and do retrofits in, in kind of smaller areas where we're having issues and then lower the temperature out of the plant um, after that. Right. Thank you. Um, the second part of this question is, can you elaborate on the advantage of using a 10 inch campus hot water loop that branches would pull from um, second, second building, secondary buildings approach? Yeah, so I can try to. Try to do that one again. So we have uh, yeah. we've got a loop a ring. So a, a lot a lot of like central plants are designed kind of as a tree structure where the pipes are kind of biggest close to the central plant and they get smaller as you get further along. Um, you know our approach is a little different where we have a ring main, um, and that ring main is uh, kind of the largest pipe all the way around, right? So it's a full ten inch all the way around. Um, even though we didn't necessarily need to have it that big all the way around. Um, and that's just because we don't know where the growth on the campus is going to be. We might build new development in the top right, bottom left, bottom right, you know, it could be anywhere. So by having the full capacity in the ring main, we can kind of tee off of that ring main and, uh, and connect it to the new building and have it be fed from our low carbon central plant. All right, great. Thank you. Hope that answers this question. Um, I'll move on to a question for Bonnie. Um, Joel Bettens asks um, that where does ship fuel fit in this and how can we reduce or end its use, uh, specifically talking about bunker fuel? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the ships are the largest contributor to the, um, to the emissions, no doubt. And, um, and the ships are increasingly um, being asked to regulate um, through the, the IMO has put out some new goals that are more aggressive than they've been in the past. The ports are constantly asking as well as the regulators like EPA and CARB um, asking them to address this. What we've seen happen, you know, only like 10, five years ago, there was a heavy push for LNG, CNG, and we saw some of the ships actually change over to that. For example, Pasha here in the San Pedro port complex, we built, built some new ships. However, what we're hearing, gotta be, um, what we're hearing um, now is that some of the environmental groups are, um, are not in favor of CNG, LNG because of the potential methane releases that could occur in an accident. Um, due to the bunkering. So um, so that's coming forward, even though, you know, all of us believe that at least for an interim solution, LNG CNG is a good, a good approach. Right now, um, the real momentum seems to be around ammonia and hydrogen as the fuel that could, as the engine that could work in ships going the long haul. You can't electrify, obviously, and come across oceans. So um, so ammonia is probably a good one, but it's a little longer term because it's got its challenges, again, for bunkering and corrosive qualities and potential safety issues that have to be addressed. And, and, um, and hydrogen is a good alternative, but it's not here tomorrow. So um, what we really are looking at that's probably quicker is green methanol. And again, though, we need to do the bunkering for that. 
And so we're in conversations with many folks about how fast we could get green methanol bunkering. And the ships are look very much looking at rebuilding um, with dual fuel engines right now. So I do believe you're going to start to see some motion around that. Again, probably incentivized by the customers more so than even the regulators. Great. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I'll move on to a question addressed to Andre. Um, Jim Bogart asks, were you able to use duct, boosters co duct booster coils to minimize the coil changes to AHU when changing the system from steam to hot water? Um, to my knowledge, that's that's not an approach that that we took. Um, I, I wasn't super heavily involved in in those projects. Um, I think generally our approach is is to put in redesigned coils that that will last for the lifetime of the system. Actually, um, okay, I just answered it on the Q and A actually, but uh, right. for the oh. most part, we didn't need to because the existing coils were sufficient at one fifty five or one sixty. It was still. Um, plenty of heat for our needs. So it, it really wasn't as much of an issue as at least in our climate as as uh, you might have suspected. Right. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Okay, another question for Andre is, um, how did your team handle the issue with the cooking time and the need to produce high volume of food at Segundo? Um, is it not a huge issue during the low traffic hours? Um, so actually that project isn't done yet. Um, phase two right. is, is set to start uh, next summer. Um, right. So we're currently working on trying to select the best possible um, equipment that will minimize that kind of downtime. Right. Um, that picture that I took was actually from Segundo on an existing piece of equipment. So it, it had already a full hour of, of warm up time, which I think an electrified um, version would be able to keep up with. Um, but during swing periods, like, when they have to, they have to heat up food and then they have to actually chill the food within a certain amount of time. Um, that might become more of an issue. Like I said, it's a little unclear right now. It's just it's kind of something that that's been on my mind um, related to our big shift project. All right, thank you. Another question uh, directed to both Andre and Aman is: Do you have any large humid uh, humidification for lab and Bavarians primarily? Um, load that was served by steam. Consultants have recommended adiabatic humidification as an alternative technology solution, but our operations staff have maintained maintenance and air quality concerns. This is from uh, Selena Liu. So whoever wanted to, wants to take this. Go ahead, Andre. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that we do have steam humidification systems on campus. Um, again, it's it's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, so I'm I'm not 100 percent sure there. Yeah, Andre, I don't know if if uh, Sam or Hiroko want to jump in. We really don't have much humidification except for um, some special needs areas, like in the library, uh, uh, special collections. I think it's all been addressed with local humidification, uh, electric or, or otherwise. Um, but yeah, so I don't I don't know that we can answer your question very well. I can, uh, can I can give our perspective. So Great. we we don't have a lot of um, like process humidification load in labs, um, like you asked, but we do have um, just uh, humidification loads due to our weather, right? So we typically humidify our built our um, our fresh air in the winter and and also need to dehumidify just given our climate. Uh, we looked at um, adiabatic systems. We had similar concerns around maintenance. We also looked at ultrasonic systems. In the end, we mostly went with um, just local humidification, electric humidification, you know, for, for air handlers. Sometimes where we had a lot of loads together, maybe a, a steam, uh, electric steam boiler that was feeding multiple loads together. All right. Looks like we have a, a bunch of other questions for you, Aman. So uh, Benjamin Levy says, great work and presentation. Did you look at uh, thermal energy storage versus battery. Also in Canada, big subsidies for geothermal heat exchange. Was this not feasible? Do you have to change any VAV coils on your buildings for the lower temperature source? Yeah, all really good questions. So um, I'll tackle them one at a time. Right. Thermal energy storage, we looked at um, a, chill, a large chilled water storage tank. Um, it was in our original feasibility study. 
Um, did it make sense in the end? Um, we a lot of a lot of the decisions we made. I mean, they're they're around how um, we're incentivized due to our, our uh, electricity rate structure. So in Ontario, if we can lower our demand for five hours in the year when our grid is peaking, we can uh, significantly lower our electricity costs. So we were able to handle our cooling loads through controls. Um, just by changing set points and kind of maintain like pre-cooling and then um, through controls, kind of maintaining higher set points for three or four hours. Um, and so the chilled water storage tank just didn't make sense for us. Um, question about uh, subsidies for uh, ground source geothermal. Um, the subsidies are relatively new. We've got some new ones, um, some tax credits for, for, um, for those systems. Um, they weren't in place back then. Back then, geothermal was just too expensive, right? We weren't able to hit our thresholds for um, uh, the economic feasibility for the project, but we're high. We're proponents of, of the technology and it might be part of the, the mix in the future for us. Um, and then around changing coils, didn't get into it in the presentation, but one of the, um, one of the things that we had in our favor is just due to the vintage of our buildings, we didn't have a lot of steam within the buildings. So we had right. steam from the central plant, to the buildings and then a heat exchanger from steam to hot water within the buildings. So we didn't have to do a lot of work within the buildings converting okay. coil. All right, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, question for um, Andre and, and everybody at ECO. Um, so they asked that, did seismic requirements affect any of UC Davis steam retrofit equipment selections? Uh, I'm going to have to have my team comment on that. Yeah, I, I tried to answer that one uh, it, typing in, but I, I, maybe they, they can specify what they mean by equipment selection. But right. in, in general, hot water is a lot better than steam when you have earthquakes. Um, but yeah, we have some seismic you know, requirements for our area, but um, it didn't really affect the steam, the 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 equipment selection. Right, okay. So maybe more specifics would be good. Yeah, maybe they can um, message you directly sure. about that. And I think with that, uh, we're out of time for the question answer session. I, I would like to thank the speakers once again for their wonderful talks and being patient with the questions and answering them uh, very well. And I think I'll pass it over to Tierney now.